Thanks to that piece of shit, Lieutenant, that's always uh, on his podcast. Bash us. F- him. <laughs> All right, everybody. Eric Dim, your most complained cop, NYPD. This is New York's finest retired and filtered podcast. This is our 265 Police Live series. Of course, with me is the founder and the co-host of the podcast, Sean McCary, retired lieutenant, NYPD. At this point, I would love to honor the life and memory of Jonathan Diller, NYPD police officer who served honorably for the New York City Police Department, who lost his life tragically last night to an armed thug in New York City. At this time, I just want to have a moment of silence and honor his memory. With that being said, John, please read, please read, and if you could explain the events that unfolded to the end of watch for Jonathan Dillard. Yeah, so Jonathan Dillard had uh, three years on the job. He was a member of the Queen CRT team. He, uh, he went to conduct a car stop and uh he stopped a male who had 21 prior arrests who was recently let out of prison I believe he was accompanied by another male who actually had an open case for a gun a gun charge that he got in, in last april who's also not in prison and uh unfortunately during that encounter jonathan was shot in his stomach under his vest um, and unfortunately he succumbed to his injuries. So, you know, terrible. He's a father of a one-year-old child. He's married. Um, I, I really, you know, I really don't know what to say about it. It's, it's really horrible. It's uh, it, you know, it reminds me a lot about Brian Moore also lived in Massapequa. It reminds me a lot of Russell Timoshenko. You know, it's tragic when you hear someone starting out proactive cop, who really heads in the right place, who wants to ensure public safety and they lose their life as a result. Um, so it's tragic. I, I feel for the wife. Um, I, I don't know if this is true, but I did. Re- I just received a text uh, right before we got on this. I believe it is. Uh, I believe we'll, we'll find out in the coming days. Um, but I just received a text and it said that, uh, Donald Trump did reach out to the widow, uh, spoke with her, and immediately following that phone call, uh, Tunnel to Towers called and said that they would pay off the widow's mortgage. So again, at this time, it's I'm not confirming it, but that's what I'm hearing. And it sounds very likely knowing Donald Trump and knowing Siller, I believe that is something that they would both do. So, you know. Well, with that being said, it's it's... It couldn't have been a better time to go into this episode. We're talking about vicarious trauma. That's the title of this episode. Talking about CCRB watching body camera footage and the effects of it. And it's quite interesting because I myself, and I I don't want to make this about me, but it's just a great comparison. So here we lost the life honorably of a police officer that served his city. I mean, He's not even a resident of New York City, but he put his life on the line for the residents of New York City. With only three years on the, on the job, he lost his life tragically and leaves behind a family. But the perpetrator that took his life was Arba Thug with 21 some odd arrests. And what does that remind me of is that was the majority of my civilian complainants that tore down my public record, my 50A, and tarnished my career, which is why I own the name Most Complaint Cop, and I wear it as a moniker to mock the system, the system that has painted cops as these these ferocious men that go out and just tear down the fabric of society, and yet, ironically, a majority of the men and women that walk with a 50A of civilian complainants are the men and women that are doing intrusive police work out there keeping the city safe, just as Jonathan Diller on that tragic night. So it's important that we understand and we we take a great bird's eye look into what's going on with the Civilian Complaint Review Board. So particularly, we have a video. Uh, John, do you have it? Where CCRB uh, 
is indicating the trauma that their investigators sustained from watching body camera footage involving police encounters, the police work that police officers have to endure on a daily basis. I mean, before before we even get into, into that video, I mean, it's ironic that, you know, the title of this is, is Vicarious Trauma because, you know, CCRB is making the claim that they feel trauma by watching a body camera video of a police officer who, when they've never actually have done that work. So they can't put themselves in the shoes of a police officer. So it's a lot different for a civilian watching a body camera than it is, or hearing a radio transmission, than it is for a cop. Um, because you've been there, you know what it's like. Uh, you feel that, you know, and then, you know, we, we lose the life of a young officer that, again, didn't have to happen. 21 arrests, that person who had 21 arrests, who by all means asked more than 21 times to go to jail, I'm sure. It was only 21 times he got caught, but he asked to be put in prison and we didn't. And we in New York City, we put those people ahead of the people who go to work every day and pay taxes and the people who serve New York City and put their lives on the line. And watching it, you know, as a retired member now, I mean, I've got to say, like, I, it's traumatizing, man. I, I see why all the retired guys take to social media, still show up at the funerals, still reach out to all their friends after it because it, it, it brings back harsh memories and it's very real for everybody. Remember the times that people that you worked with passed away and now you know that kid could have been you and then you kind of almost have victim's remorse. And, you know, I think you could have that on the job as well, especially if you, you're you close with the person, you worked with them. Um, I think people do have victim's remorse a lot in the NYPD. So I, I just find it complete insanity that CCRP is asking for a full-time therapist for vicarious trauma for watching a body camera. Eric, what do you think the trauma is for a member of the NYPD wearing a body camera day in and day out? I'm so glad that you just had mentioned that. So like John said, he's asking, what is the trauma that cops have to, that cops endure? by actually donning that body camera on a daily basis for an entire tour, sometimes because of a, of a shortage in the NYPD, 16-hour tours with overtime and you know, maybe a two, three-hour lapse and coming right back to work and wearing that body camera again, having that responsibility. So on a prior podcast, we did an episode about body cameras, and we explored this idea. I actually reached out to different mental health professionals trying to find out if there's any studies on this yet. So I wasn't able to obtain any of that information, but... Sure enough, again, I believe that this podcast has foreshadowed numerous different events, including talking about trauma when it comes to body cameras. I just didn't think it was going to come from CCRB. It's kind of ironic. And I, I, I have to agree with you. I think that's a fantastic point that you just highlighted because I had listened to the radio transmission yesterday several times of the car stop that led to the death of Jonathan Diller, New York City police officer. And it was just it was so gut wrenching. And it's, it, it's, it's, it's just so gut-wrenching because of the perspicacious mindset that you have being a former cop, that you could feel yourself being there and you, and, and you want to help. And you could feel, I could, I could hear the tone in the cop's voice and, and, and just the, the, the terror and the horror that he's going through. And he felt helpless having his, his partner shot there. It, it's just, and those seconds feel like hours waiting for help to respond. And you hear those sirens. It's just, Time slows down. It's uh, the 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 walls just start caving in as you get that tone vision. It's just we've all been there. Your heart is racing. I could feel myself, and I was listening to that transmission. I'm sure, John, you feel the same way about this incident. Is you could feel the the hairs on your body just going up, and I I, I was actually listening to it sweating because I could feel myself being there. And I spoke to other retired people, and this was I, I, another lieutenant had said to me, a, a former lieutenant, a buddy of mine, said. This was the only time recently that I wish I was back on the job from retirement because I wish I could be there to help. And I said, you know what? I, I can't, I can't agree with you more. I enjoy retirement. I enjoy this path that we have, but those are the moments that you wish you were there 
because you know you have the experience and you want to help. You want to do everything in your power to help. But just to hear this gut-wrenching, chilling radio transmission was just uh, – it is. I think that's a great point. It's actually traumatizing because we understand it. We've been in volatile situations. Thank God I never had someone dying in my arms, but we've been in those situations where you thought it was the last moment of your life. But for CCRB to actually say that they have trauma, I think it's insulting to the everyday New York City police officers, especially since they're the ones that do these investigations to determine if police officers are acting appropriately. I just think it's it, it's completely uh, ridiculous. Most of the CCRB investigators are still home because of COVID. They're working remote, so they have that luxury. And you're shaking your head, no? No, I'm shaking oh. my head. I can't oh. believe that they're still home. I'm shaking. I, I can't oh. even believe that. I, I can't. Yeah, I it's absolutely. It, again, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. So you hear police officers, five and numerous New York City agencies had to leave the job because of a mandate. Fired oh, veteran oh. city agency oh. workers. Oh. And yet these investigators are using the weight of their organization to make to make egregious decisions upon the police department, which include termination because of the disciplinary matrix. And yet they want to say that they're experiencing trauma. And that's why they have a mass exodus in the CCRB and they can't keep up with the complaints. But yet you expect a police officer to endure 20 years of hostility, working in a volatile environment, and never curse, never have a lapse of judgment, never make a mistake. I just think it's completely ironic. It's absolutely ridiculous. No, absolutely, and uh, just just in the intro, you know, I think we we missed a few things. That, you know, uh, big shout out to to Diller's partner. You know, he uh, he returned fire, struck one of the perps. Both perps were apprehended on the scene. He you know he was able to to under extreme duress, you know, under in extreme circumstances was still able to put out the radio transmission, was still able to return fire and the perps were apprehended. Um, so, you know, if you listen to this, you know, great job, you know, hearts go out to you. It's nothing you could have done differently. Obviously there's nothing that could have happened. It, it, it is what it is. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, this is the nature of police work. And, and unfortunately people don't respect the NYPD until things like this happen. And it's, it's very it's very hard for me today. I kind of stayed off social media all day um, because I, I, I really I just want to rip politicians heads off because I'm listening to them all give condolences and all. Oh, I stand with the NYPD when they do everything but stand with the NYPD. So I, I don't I don't want to politicize someone's death. And out of respect for the family, I've been staying away. But. I will be on in the days coming, um, particularly after the funeral. And I will be going out to all those politicians who wanted to defund you, who tell you that you're systemically racist, that you're brutalizers, that you want to shut down free speech when it's everything but the opposite. The, the fact is they put people like this piece of garbage who killed a young New York City police officer, a father of a one year old, a husband, a son, a neighbor, somebody that was a good all around person, they put his murderer on a pedestal. And the man who was killed his entire life was getting shit thrown on him. So, you know, I, I give a shout out to all of you who are still doing it in New York, but it's 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 really heart wrenching to watch this. To, and, and at this time, it's 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 very difficult. Yeah, I, I, like I said, I you know I put out a tweet, and again, you know, we make satire memes on, on a daily basis to really bring out the messaging of what's going on with the New York City Police Department, policing as a whole, nationwide, worldwide, the politics that have penetrated it uh, through through uh, through comedy, and uh, we've actually laid low on it because this is just the time to reflect. And I, I will say this, and in response to my tweet, and and, and this is this is real, every cop local, city, state, nationwide, and worldwide, active or retired, hurts when something like this happens, feels the pain, because Jonathan Diller, you represent us all. Uh, it, he He's John McCarry. He's Eric Dem. He's all of us. And we are Jonathan Diller. We've all been there, and we're just fortunate enough to be in retirement and to still have all our fingers and toes. And unfortunately, 
he lost his life. And, and 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 the shame about this is we'll hear the politicians, as you said, I know we'll get more into this in a few days from now, and they'll stand up and they'll say that they stand with the NYPD and they'll honor Jonathan D Diller and they'll, they'll use terms as he's a hero, which is easy to say. But yet, do they really mean it? Because it's short-lived. They have short memories. Because in a few, a few days past, as time goes on, you'll see that the, these politicians will quickly forget about it. And they'll be back to... Uh, Back to the old, you know, the same song and, and the old routine. It's unfortunate, but who's left really bearing the pain? It's his wife and his child. They're bearing left in this pain forever. The police department, the entire city will move on. But that's really who suffers the most. His wife and his child have to forever remember this. And I'm sure his wife is asking questions. You know, did my did my husband lose his life in vain? You know, was it worth it? These questions you know, will come up. And I will say this, uh, you know, it's no life lost by a police officer, police officer. Um, is, is just a life. The life of a police officer is the bedrock and the foundation for the entire city. When we lose a police officer, we, we're we tearing down a brick of the foundation of the city because that police officer represents us all. So we must take this seriously. And for all those that that stand up and speak out, and, and I say it all the time, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. We have to continue this path. We have to speak out. We need more podcasts. We need more social media content. We have to speak out. We need a seismic shift. The pendulum has to swing back. It has to be back to a societal norm. And, and I said it again, I, you know, it's unfortunate. I've been saying that we're going to lose the life of a New York City police officer by other means than a firearm. And unfortunately, it happened with a firearm too, too recent. And it, it's it's... It, it really just pains me, and I, and I wish I was wrong. I I, I, I foresaw this coming. It, it's so unfortunate, and uh, we have to step in. We we need we need tough leadership. We need tough laws. We need tough legislation. We have to bring this back, and it will come back. But we have to keep pounding the pavement. Yeah, and we need tough people. We need tough people, especially those in retirement, to stand up and and speak out and give their experience and really humanize the profession. You know, uh, Eric and I have been doing a lot of different podcasts and, you know, we've been speaking to a lot of different people. And the overall thing I always find is people are shocked by our answers. They're shocked. It's not because, you know, we're brilliant people or anything. It's because they don't understand policing and, and the news media and the leadership nationwide in law enforcement has done a god awful job of explaining what it is that a police officer does. What are the trials and tribulations that a police officer face? Back to blue, back to blue, the thin blue line. Uh, I support cops. This, it, it, it's great. It's, it's nice. It's good for the cops to hear, but the public doesn't understand that. And really need advocates out there, out there in society, in public. I mean, look at the anti-police movement. I mean, the anti-police movement is in high schools. They're in junior high schools. They're walking around the streets. They have booths set up at fairs. They, they're out there in the community, and they're giving them false information about police officers. I mean, look at New York City. Look at the New York City Police Department. Just take a picture of any precinct in New York City and tell me that this is a white supremacist organization. Running it for which white supremacists that are in power in New York City. I mean, but yet... We constantly hear how the NYPD is a racist organization. And, and it, it it boggles my mind. I'm like, these are all poor children of immigrants made up of every background in this entire world. And you're going to sit there and say that these people are racist. And, you know, I, I get the whole argument, oh, systems could be racist. This could be racist. The NYPD is trying to fight crime. And then... If you're going to sit there and say that 28,000 people, 27,000 people are out there enforcing this racism and no one's speaking up about it. I mean, come on. It's just not even accurate. It's just it's it's so far from the truth in the modern day age. I mean, we see everything on video. We have body camera video almost at a moment's notice, cell phone video. And, you know, but yet the message is strong and the message is strong because there's no one out there willing to say the truth, to say what it is, to say the hard facts. I'm sure right now someone's in CCRB is watching this and they feel trauma from watching this. And they're, uh, they're, they're, uh, what, what is it? I'm, uh, 
I'm I'm uh I'm offended. I'm offended. I, this, this this whole podcast offended me. These these two retired lieutenants offended me. I mean, I'm not trying to offend you, but it is what it is. This is the truth. The truth is, look at what these guys face every day, and you can't handle watching a video. Well, I think it's absolutely ridiculous, first of all, that the CCRB actually wants to demonize the police even further by by trying to drag on these statute of limitations and not giving fair and due process to these actual CCRB cases by actually claiming that there's a form of trauma from watching these body cameras. I think it's absolutely ridiculous that they're actually even using that as a platform to argue why their investigations are not done in time. I think that it just proves that this organization is completely inadequate and they're doing everything in their power to substantiate these cases. And if these investigations cannot be done properly within the statute, then these investigations should be dismissed. And we need a harder stance from the New York City Police Department that does not push back. And that is a huge problem. The problem with the leadership of the police department is that they can't articulate and they cannot push back. And that it's a huge problem. We have a, a terrible PR campaign right now with the New York City Police Department. They could not push back on this narrative, and so there's either two there there's either two segments to this. So one, either they refuse to push back, or one, they just don't have the ability to push back. And either one, I find highly problematic. And we need new leadership to actually combat this this disdain from the Civilian Complaint Review Board against the New York City Police Department. And if they can't cut the mustard and do these investigations within 18 months, that's a long amount of time to investigate a civilian complaint. With the technology that they have right now, the subpoena power, the ability, the snap of the fingers that they have to actually get documentation and records to investigate a case, this is just, this uh, is just completely uh, inadequate, especially for the fact that the investigators are comfy at home and have the ability to work remotely i think this is absolutely ridiculous if they want to say that they they're actually experiencing trauma again i think that's a complete insult to everyday police officer it's an insult to detectives that have been investigating cases they've been watching video and surveillance since the beginning of the inception of television watching man hours to investigate a case and yet these investigators are experiencing trauma for something that they have no idea and suffer from the Dunning-Kruger effect and have no idea what it is to actually live the life of a police officer in a real-time environment, not from not from your mommy's house and your mommy's basement. And this is just absolutely ridiculous. No, so I'm going to play the first video I want to get into. This is, again, from the preliminary budget hearing for fiscal year 2025 from the Committee on Public Safety. After the department goes up, uh, now CCRB goes up and what they're doing is they're requesting funding. So they give all their funding requests. Obviously, like I said, this is an organization that's trying to put its footprint in the world and any government organization, what do they do? They look to expand. They look to improve. They want more money. They want, they want notoriety. They want to feel important. So this was the part that I, I literally, I was, I would just got coffee and I was like listening and I know I'm probably a loser. I know people tell me like, you're listening to these budget hearings and you're retired. But I mean, I just, I can't take my eyes off of this. I mean, it's, it's, it's something I always did. I did as a cop. I, I, I'm just not going to change who I am in retirement. It's who I am. I, I care. Um, I, I hate to see mismanagement. I, I believe the CCRB is way more mismanaged than the NYPD. And I believe there's a lot of mismanagement in the NYPD currently, but so they're gonna i'm just gonna play this video but anyway i was walking with my coffee and i heard this and i dropped my phone because i was in shock i was like i can't even believe what i just heard here it is there has been a high need to assist civilians who struggle with the aftermath of trauma and staff internally who suffer from vicarious trauma and burnout as a result of interacting with traumatized civilians and viewing hundreds of hours of graphically violent video in the ordinary course of their work Currently, we have a grant-funded therapist, but her hours are limited to seven hours a week, and the grant doesn't allow the specialist to meet the demand for these kinds of services. Since the repeal of New York State Civil there has been a high need to assist civilians who struggle with the... Yeah, so... Well, all right, so let's talk about trauma, right? 
So it's very interesting, right? So the Civilian Complaint Review Board has uh, has admitted, the same person here, Arbor Rights, has admitted in the past that they don't take into the totality of circumstances in an event when there's a civilian complaint and they're doing their investigation on the behalf of a police officer. They only take into account of the emotions that were experienced by the civilian complaint themselves. So with that being said, again, they're doing it again. They're vilifying the police department by not taking into account the trauma that police officers experience, by not giving police officers the benefit, benefit of the doubt for incidents when they do their investigations. They don't take that into account. But yet, they're saying that if you if you heard that, uh, I'm not sure if people actually heard that when she actually spoke. She said that there's a burnout period. So they're saying that their investigators are burnt out from watching body camera footage in a controlled environment. Most of these investigators are working remotely from home. And keep in mind, I would say, you know, I, I listen, I've been to Civilian Complaint Review Board more times than I could count, more times than most people for these investigations. Actually, being the most complaint cop, I've been there the most. And I would say that the average age of these investigators was probably maybe 20, 21 years old. They're very young. So these are young, energetic people that have life in them, that have not even experienced trauma in their life to actually understand what trauma is. And they're working comfortably from home in a controlled environment. And yet they're burnt out. They can't continue these investigations. But they hold the police department accountable to a standard to display extreme professionalism at all times and be held to an account of subjectiveness that they expect from the civilian complaint review board. They expect police officers as myself in a riot to conduct themselves in a certain manner when they have urine being thrown at them, when they have bricks being thrown at them, when they're being spit on, not to react with force, not to make arrest. They expect police officers not to shout back, not to use curse words, but yet the Civilian Complaint Review Board investigators are burnt out from watching these videos, and they have experienced trauma that requires mental health. Police officers are committing suicide at an epidemic rate year on a yearly basis, and yet they get they don't get the mental health that Oliver Rice is saying that the C CCRB investigators are getting seven hours a week. Police officers don't even get that, and yet they can't continue with their investigations, and they can't handle watching body cameras. The people who are investigating the men and women wearing the body cameras can't handle watching the body cameras. I mean, it's a problem. It's a big, big problem. It shows that they cannot rationalize the scenario that this police officer is in. Again, I don't know how they're viewing themselves. They must be viewing themselves as the victim. They can't be viewing themselves as the police officer. So they don't understand the gravity of the situation as the, the what what is going on in a police officer's mind. Um, and I think that's a big fail on having an all civilian agency where there's only a liaison. There needs to be actual people with law enforcement experience inside of the CCRB. CCRB is a mess. I mean, they have always had a high turnover, rate, right? Because like you said, they're younger people. They have this free, caring, liberal ideology. But as they get older, as they get smarter, as they start to interview cops, as they get more of an interaction in New York City, take the train, walk around, they see the crime, they start to understand a little bit. Some of them, I'd, say, I'd actually say a lot of them, a lot of them start to understand what the life of is a New York City police officer. I actually, I actually had a kid who was a CCRB investigator who worked for me. He was a cop. He was a cop, still on patrol till today. Uh, I actually seen him in a viral video not too long ago. I won't blow his name up because I don't want anyone to know, but he actually became a cop. He was from out of state. He moved to New York City, became a CCRV investigator. And he was like, wow, I think I want to be a cop. These, these people are actually doing God's work. And, and he signed up and he's, he's, had a, he's had a fruitful career and he's out there every day on New York City streets. And I think that's what happens. I think people leave, you know, I think due to the mismanagement, the real, there's no real calling there after a while, because I think after a while you start to see that, who am I protecting? Who am I protecting? So they go on to talk about the attrition rate in the CCRB. They don't know what the attrition rate was when the public safety chair 
asks Yusef Salam, who was honestly horrible. I mean, he he like was reading off a piece of paper. It was it was brutal to sit through and listen to Yusef Salam wait minute pauses in between questions. Um, but he does ask them, what is the attrition rate? And they have no idea. And then he says, well, what's your biggest, uh, where do you lose the most people? And they say, the investigators, we lose the most investigate. We lose the most in the investigator position, but they don't know the, the attrition rate of it. So like, mm -hmm. I guess you're just going off anecdotal experience. So I just find it funny. They come to this meeting to ask for money, to say that they need more people, that they're going to lose people if they don't have this, but they don't have the stats with them to come across that, to actually present that case and make that case. Well, we see it time and time again. CCRB is completely <clears throat> inadequate, and they come to these meetings unprepared. And, and, you know, it's interesting to highlight, right, because the Civilian Complaint Review Board has been part of this movement where they feel that the New York City Police Department should be encompassed by men and women that match the communities that they work in. So I would say the same ideology should go for the CCRB investigators that actually investigate police department, law enforcement movement in the same city that they're making subjective opinions on. And most of the Civilian Complaint Review Board investigators that I have dealt with is exactly what you just said, someone that is from out of state. And I would say in most cases, when I actually had my investigations from the CCRB, when I sat down with the investigator and I had my, the police department calls it the GO-15, General Order 15, but actually what it is, it's actually an interview where the CCRB investigators, they actually, in layman's, layman's terms, interview me, ask me a series of questions to make a determination on an actual incident. And what I found is most of the investigators, they had no idea of the locations where I was working. They never even been there themselves. They couldn't even find it on a map. They would actually have to pull up a map to actually figure out where it was. So they didn't experience these New York City streets themselves, but yet they were making an opinion on how they would feel, or at least how the complainant would feel in an arrest situation that I was dealing with, or my team was dealing with, in a metropolis like New York City. And for most of these investigators, they came from rural towns outside New York City. Most of them were from the Midwest. And their only experience of New York City was actually, and I'm sorry, they their first job in New York City was being a civilian complaint review, review board investigator. So most of them had never even been to these locations that they were investigating. And the only time that they actually viewed these locations was through a Google map when they were doing these investigations. So it's kind of ironic that the police officers that are held to a completely different standard from the civilian complaint review board, which has extreme amount of weight to hold against the police department, especially with this discipline matrix in such a volatile time that we're living in. So I'm going to play the next clip where they don't know the attrition rate, but again, we're going to hear about vicarious trauma. And I just, again, they're coming to these meetings completely unprepared. I believe the New York City Police Department does a great job at preparing or at least supplying somewhat good answers. And if because some of the information that's requested is absolutely ridiculous at these meetings, but I believe the police department, if the police department got caught like this without knowing the attrition rate and things like that, I mean, there would be, there would be hell to pay for them. There would be hell to pay. Um, and again, no agency is held to the standard of the New York city police department. There is no agency in New York city that is held to the standard. And you see it throughout this whole meeting. You know, if anyone is curious, I recommend if you're on the job, if you're, uh, if you're a city worker, if you live in New York city, I really recommend you listen to these meetings because you will get an eye-opening experience. There's about a, a there's a there's about 20 members of New York City Council and the only thing they could critique is the New York City Police Department. They have zero thoughts about any other agency. They have zero thoughts about how to improve the New York City Police Department. They have zero thoughts on public safety whatsoever, but they only like to just point fingers at, at the, the police department and say where they're doing a bad job. And most of the time, they're dead wrong. So here's the CCRB. Here's the, the other part of their testimony. There are certain job titles in which the attrition rate is, const is considerably higher than the agency as a whole. The, the role of investigators is the role that's most sensitive um, and within our agency. And we have investigators at three different levels. 
um, and, a, and work, they work in a number of years in one level and they look to be promoted to the other. And so I can have the executive director talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the chair is correct. Uh, the investigator position is the one with the highest level of turnover. One of the reasons for that is the, the difficult nature of the position, investigating complaints where you're viewing hundreds of hours of body-worn camera footage. Uh, and that, as the chair said in her testimony, is extremely stressful and, and causes, exposes the investigators to vicarious trauma. There's certain You know, it's uh, it's interesting logic, John, isn't it? Right? It's it's quite interesting logic by by what he's saying. If you actually can, you can make the inference that what he's actually saying here that the role of the civilian complaint review board investigator is far more stressful than that of the actual police officer. That their jobs are just so stressful from watching these body cameras that they can't keep them employed. That they're running out of this job because watching man hours of body cameras is just so stressful far more stressful than that of the police officer that actually has to live the life of wearing that body camera and actually living and breathing the air in these actual police encounters or police situations i think it's completely laughable and again i think that's a great point to highlight is that there again the ccrb is known for always asking for money anytime there's an election and if there's an opportunity for the CCRB to get more funding, the CCRB is always ready to take uh, to allocate funding. But yet, they are unprepared. They can't provide any data to back their claims. You know, I, I think that, again, I go back to the fact that most of these investigators are extremely young. Some of them are out of college. Some of them are still in college. I, don't, I, I think that they don't view this as a career in the long term. I believe that this is a stepping stone for most of these investigators to get their feet wet in this uh, independent organization. For some of them, they just have complete disdain for the police department. They've listened to this propaganda while they go to college and these liberal universities. And they have an opportunity to take a bite at a police department in this manner where they have a complete authority of subjective opinion of a New York City police officer. And I do agree with you. I think some of them make a seismic shift when they start to see what actually goes on in a police officer. They start, start to actually experience New York City and they say, oh, my God, holy cow, you know, I, I got to get out of this perfection. I, you know, I can't. And they see the disdain for the for the police officers. And with some of them, I believe, you know, this is just a, a step moving towards maybe law school or some other facet. But I don't see anyone seeing it as a long term career. No, I mean, I think that's beautifully said. And, and actually, when I when I posted that. I said that. I said, oh, I'd lo also love to know what the attrition rate was prior to the inception of body camera and how it changed since body camera. Because I'll guarantee, without even knowing the data, it hasn't changed at all. The attrition rate has probably remained the same prior to the inception of body worn cameras. So they don't even know the reason, or they do know the reason. Um, people leaving, and they're just not saying it. They're they're putting it on this vicarious trauma. And again, I just think I, I think it really is a slap in the face. And, and New York City police officers, unions, the police unions, they should be all over this. They should be all over. Are they, are, are they mentally stable enough? Are your investigators mentally stable enough to properly investigate the work that our officers do? Are they? Because, I mean... How many hours of body camera vi video do police officers view? Do sergeants view? Do lieutenants view? Do captains view? Do chiefs view? They review hundreds of hours, and that's like literally probably 0.05% of their responsibilities for the day. I mean, you're, they're constantly reviewing body camera at this point. You know, they're doing their own investigations against their own members, against themselves, getting ready to testify in court. And that's just a fraction of what these people experience every day. I mean, it's, you know, I think another thing you, you spoke about a long time ago when we did that body camera episode, you talked about what are the mental effects going to be on, what are the mental effects going to be on police officers? And you said paranoia. You said, I really believe at some point there should be a study done on how it affects paranoia because- 
consistently worried about being videotaped, being critiqued. You know, so I think that's they're still I think we should really start to raise the red flag on that. What are the effects of body worn camera? What is a healthy amount of time to wear a body worn camera to be on camera? Because that's trauma. That is real trauma. That is trauma. And then you know what? What else are the mental? What is the what else is the trauma? What is the vicarious trauma for the guy, the men and women who work for you, Eric, then when they see you going down a CCRB, when they know they're being investigated, when they know they're being scrutinized eight ways to Sunday, the chief's looking at this, the borough's looking at this, my CO's looking at this, the lieutenant's looking at this, my sergeant's looking at this, CCRB is looking at this, inspections is looking at this, internal affairs is looking at this, FID could be possibly looking at this. What is the trauma experienced by a New York City police officer? And how long could somebody do that and still stay mentally healthy? Well, that always that actually goes, I've said this a long time ago. So I'm glad that this actually came up because I said these investigators that have, you know, again, who suffer from the Dunning-Kruger effect, they have no knowledge of police work. They don't have an actual perspective because they didn't actually walk the shoes themselves. And now that to hear that they're suffering from apparently vicarious trauma, this actually solidifies everything I've said about paranoia. If they're paranoid while watching this video and they can't sustain the mental health stability while watching these videos, how can they make an actual subjective, uh, 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 not a subjective, but actually an objective opinion on video that they when, that they watch when, they, when they're watching it painfully? If they're watching it and they're suffering trauma while they're watching it, how can they actually emotionally detach themselves to make the best decision? based on patrol guide policy and actually the law rather than what's emotionally involved. This actually solidifies one of the cases that I had because it was said to me at one of my trials, at my administrative trial, where I was accused of putting my finger in the rear of a defendant's butt to, uh, uh, to retrieve a firearm. And there was no camera footage, obviously, of putting my hand up his butt because it did not happen. But they said from watching the camera, the inference was they believed that it that it must have happened. Uh, again, I, I, if they're saying that they're suffering from trauma to, from watching these videos, that means they cannot make a proper assessment. Because we always say, as a police officer doing your job, to properly do the job so that you don't get hooked into a situation and so that something doesn't become unprofessional and you don't use improper speech and you're not offensive or you're not using improper force. You're not excessive or unnecessary. You have to be emotionally detached. So if they're suffering trauma, that means they're emotionally attached to the situation and they're not making a proper assessment. So these cases should be dismissed. Absolutely. Absolutely. What's the vicarious trauma for every New York City police officer today who does a car stop this point forward? What's it every time they eat lunch in the car and they remember Lou and Ramos who got assassinated sitting in their car doing absolutely nothing wrong? What's the vicarious trauma for the members of the New York City Police Department for the unyielding the unyielding amount of scrutiny that they face each and every day, each and every day. There's another part too. There's actually another part. I didn't put it out yet, so I can't get it. I can't show it to you guys. And, and I, maybe I'll put it out on the next one, but they go on a further state. They start to talk about the disciplinary matrix in, in CCRB. And CCRB says that they want the disciplinary matrix to meet the allegations they said currently the disciplinary matrix has forced entry broken down all types of unlawful entry broken down put foot in door pushed your way in and all of those are different allegations so they want the nypd to create allegations around that they also said that they want the nypd to to create more allegations breaking down curse words. Some curse words are will be deemed acceptable. And some will be deemed that you shouldn't be a member of the New York City Police Department. So it's perfectly acceptable 
for the people investigating you to experience trauma by watching the work that you do. But it's not acceptable at all for you to be functioning, living in a state of trauma while working for the NYPD. And maybe at times your talk isn't socially acceptable, isn't friendly, maybe it isn't nice, but these people want to fire you for saying it. Absolutely. Anytime we have an opportunity to examine the disciplinary matrix is an opportunity I love to explore, delve into the significance of it, especially disciplinary matrix. Uh, you and I have been the only entity to examine and highlight the uh, just complete erratic document of the disciplinary matrix. And, you know, it's it's my opinion that most of the upper echelon of the NYPD has not actually read thoroughly through the disciplinary matrix to really understand what this document is. And again, it's, 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 it's weaponized by the city council and the CCRB to demonize and ultimately terminate police officers that they don't want from the profession of the NYPD, uh, the specific type of police officers that they're targeting. And those are uh, alpha white males doing intrusive police work. Uh, so with that being said, I think it's also interesting to highlight the fact that investigators when they're watching body camera video and, and if they're sustaining the supposed trauma that they say that they're experiencing they also have another caveat an opportunity that a police officer does not have in real time the investigators have the opportunity if they're experiencing trauma while watching these videos to pause they could walk away get a cup of water take a break get a breath of fresh air they could go back collect themselves in a controlled environment they don't have to while they're watching the video that is their only that is not to sound funny at that point but that's their only job at that point just to watch that video but police officers when they're watching an adversary a person of interest just a, an encounter they're not only they don't only have to deal with what's in front of them but they have to deal with what's in and around them passengers pedestrians occupants of vehicles buildings people above them people around them just the elements of being in a metropolis in New York City. And yet we're going to compare the trauma of a CCRB investigator who's in the comfort of their home, not exposed to the elements of weather, rain, snow, extreme heat. They're comfortable at home, probably wearing pajamas, something comfortable in their home, watching camera footage in a comfortable chair, not sitting in a radio motor patrol car, in snow and rain and extreme heat, wearing a uniform with a gun belt while experiencing police encounters, still watching your back, watching your partners. This is just, again, I say this is a complete insult to every New York City police officer. And the fact that the PBA, along with other unions, has not stood up and took the opportunity to kick and scream is another abomination of these unions. And, and I, again, I, I find this just completely laughable. It's just another insult to the New York City Police Department day in and day out. That's all we hear. It's disgusting. And honestly, it's disgusting. You know, what do they have? A 7 to 3 p.m. job, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. job or a 9 to 5 job, Saturday, Sunday off, every holiday off. And I mean, just look at the trauma that police officers take. Take the profession out of it. Take take everything that they'll experience in their career. Take all the trauma that they are subjected to every tour, numerous times a tour. Take it all out. Take it all away. Just put a police officer's schedule, switch switch the CCRB investigator's schedule with that of a police officer in the New York City Police Department who doesn't know anybody, who comes on this job the same way me and you did, without a legacy, without anything, and put them in that chart and let them work just those hours. They don't even have to experience the trauma. Let me know how fast they quit because I guarantee they wouldn't make the first month. They definitely wouldn't make it through a summer. That would be real trauma. That would be that would be the most amount of trauma that these people have ever faced. Forget the body camera video. You'd lose them all. You'd lose them all within a week. Um, and and that's the that's 
really the thing. It's like, what's the even playing field, you know? I mean, I, I think Eric's been attacked the most by the CCRB, and even him, even he says that there is a need. You know, there is a need. Let them investigate. When there, there are times when police officers act out of line, and they should be disciplined. Cops shouldn't act with impunity. Cops are human. But let it be a fair, even playing field. Let it be a playing field where I am meeting a proper investigation by a rational person who understands what I face and and you don't have to have sympathy, but at least you understand it. At least you you're able to take the totality of the circumstances into an account, and you could make a rational based decision on if this incident more than like happily more than likely happened or did not. Well, there's two ways to pick at Arborice's statement, right? So I think the first one is we could say that they are completely unprepared and they're making this statement or the second uh, component that it could be to this, that they just completely don't care and have just a complete disdain and absolutely no respect for the police profession. Because to say that they, the investigators are experiencing trauma uh, in comparison to what the police officers do is just, just like I said, it's complete insult. When the police officers are, so basically what they're saying is that they're suffering trauma from watching these videos. So they're admitting they are making subjective decisions, substantiating complaints to hurt the careers of police officers that go on their 50A, that is public record for their entire lives, because as, as of now, it never comes off. And yet they're admitting that they could not walk in the shoes of an everyday police officer. I mean, they what well, they're saying, they can't even watch the video. So obviously they can't walk, they cannot walk in the same shoes of a police officer. And yet they have the ability to utilize the disciplinary matrix as the sword to decapitate a police officer's life and his career or her career. It's just absolutely ridiculous. You should actually have the same perspective. That's why I used to, I, I've said in the past, I think that CCRB is a necessary entity. I do believe that police officers, including myself, we have and had an extreme amount of accountability and responsibility. We have power. With that power, a com uh, with that power comes the responsibility and the ability that we should have to explain ourselves. We should be critiqued because we have so much power. It's the only profession that you can walk out of your precinct to get a cup of coffee. You end up in a shootout. God forbid you take someone's life, and you can still have your cup of coffee. It's one of the few professions that that. An incident just like that could happen. So, of course, you should be critiqued. You should be able to explain yourself. You should walk softly and carry that big stick. But the perspe perspective should be from people that have walked in your shoes or at least have the ability to. So that's why I, I believe that CCRB investigators, they should always be married up. And I believe that a CCRB investigator should be married up with a active or retired police officer, someone that has perspective. And I do believe that the investigation should be done by teams. Every team should have someone that is from the independent watchdog unit and also someone that is active, retired, that has police perspective. And that's the only way to account it and have some balance. And I believe that would be a better path to fair investigations. I do. I think this is a moment, though, to really look at mental health also on this job. Because... I'm not going to I'm not going to like say that maybe people are really experiencing trauma from watching these body cameras. So if they are, let's document it. Where's health and wellness? Where are the unions? Where's the upper echelon of the NYPD? What we should be doing at this point now is contacting the CCRB and and saying that it'll be a confidential thing. You just want to speak to either the individuals who are experiencing trauma or the therapist, and they don't have to release any medical information because I know we respect HIPAA law again. You know, I know we didn't in 2021 and 2022, but I think HIPAA is back in play again because um, I still don't. Kaz, you never told us if you were vaccinated or not. So we, you know, I think HIPAA, I think you're going to hide behind the HIPAA law, right? That you're not going to tell us. But um, so let's go and get that data from that therapist. And then let's start interviewing people 
who are experiencing mental crisis in the NYPD, which is everybody, anyone that's been out on the street for over five years. I mean, you know, they will have long lasting life effects in mental health, depending what they do. I mean, if they go right to a cushy gig, absolutely not. But if you're on the street for five years, 10 years, I mean, that's going to stay with you the rest of your life. You're going to experience things. And then on top of all of the new stressors with this body camera, right? Like, like Eric said, maybe we will start seeing guys with real experience, real paranoia later on down the road after wearing these body cameras. I, I agree with you, Eric. I really, I think that that is something that's actually going to happen. I mean, because the, the mental health prior to body cam, the inception of body cameras was in the garbage already. Um, so I think it's a good time to start looking at the mental health though. I really do. I think, I think let's not just write off what CCRB is saying. Let's take it and see what the experience is and, and, and measure that against what your own employees are facing. The people that are investigating your employees are claiming they have trauma based upon watching videos of what your employees do, but they didn't stand roll call with your employees, right? They're not in the head of your employees. They didn't respond to all the jobs that that employee did in that same day when that body camera took place. They didn't go home with that employee at night. And then, you know, I made this meme because this is like, this is kind of what I think about police work, you know? You know, it's vicarious trauma. It's a it's a young man in bed and he's sitting up there and he's thinking about everything that happened, you know. And I don't think any police officer doesn't go home at night and think about all of the things that happened, replayed, whether you're proud of them, whether you're not proud of them, whether you're worried about them. I mean, this is the 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 gravity of being a police officer the weight of being a police officer it affects everybody and if it doesn't affect you there's something wrong with you you shouldn't be a cop you should probably be a, a locked away in a psych ward if it doesn't affect you there's something wrong with you if, if you're human you have empathy and and that's basically what this what this is i i i, I was doing it to poke fun at the ccrb because you see a young boy sitting in a bed and he's looking and he's like reflecting back at when he's at work and they're watching this video and they're all surrounded by the video. But these moments happen for cops almost every night. I mean, they still happen to me. I haven't been on the job in two years. I still think I still vividly see things, whether they're good or bad. Um, and I think everyone kind of does. So if they're experiencing trauma, let's measure that. And let's measure that against the trauma that New York City police officers face. Yeah, that's why that's why it's important to reflect on what Arbor Rice said. When she's saying that the investigators are experiencing trauma, that's that's the contribution to attrition rate. What she's saying, you know, at least I, I, this is what I have a hard time to understand is how could she, in good conscience, actually substantiate police officers for taking action in an encounter. So let's just say, let's just say rhetorically speaking. Let's say an incident that happens during the George Floyd riots where police officers have to take action. And they're the investigators are watching the video and they're suffering trauma from watching rioters throw urine and feces at police officers and they're suffering trauma seeing the police officers respond with force. And uh the trauma that they're suffering uh, you know, it, maybe because, you know, they can't believe an incident like this is actually unfolding in New York City streets. They're watching people have to get violent with each other. But yet the police officers were actually experiencing it. But yet you're going to substantiate them and you're going to make the, the you're going to make the claim that too much force was utilized or the force was not used properly. And they had to live there. They have to the police officers had to live through it. And to ensure that they would go home with all their fingers and their toes or go home safely or go home breathing, go home alive to their families. But yet they couldn't keep their eyes open to watch the video because it was so traumatizing or they could not continue their employment. that They had to leave their job because it was too much trauma to continue to watch any vi further video. But the police officers, just like you, John, just like myself, had to respond to these riots 
And guess what? The following day, we went back to work and we went to another significant event. We continue to do police work while these investigators have the opportunity to take a day to relax and get a breath of fresh air when most of their days are an average eight hour workday, unlike a police officer who's working 16 to 20 hour days because of overtime, because of a mass exodus in the police department. So to make these comparisons and in good conscience for the civilian complaint review board to actually substantiate these complaints, I think it's just, it's just, it's horrific. I think it's evil. Honestly, I really think that it's an evil organization, that they hate the cops that much, that they have such a disdain, that they don't care that the police officers suffer trauma. Because I don't think, I, I think this this may be a bold statement to say, but I don't think they look at police officers as human. I used to actually say after an investigation, I don't think they actually look at me as, as a man. They don't see me as a human that can bleed, that I breathe. They just see me as this evil monster because I wear the uniform. But who's actually evil in this? I think the civilian compared review board is the evil character in all this. I would say that based upon her statements, I would make the assessment that she absolutely does have a disdain for the police officers and she doesn't view you as a human. And I think that that's kind of like when we were talking earlier and I was saying, like, what a great job the anti-police advocates have done. That's kind of what's happened in society is we're not human. And right. That's what I said. Like I, I said that actually earlier, we do it to try to humanize the profession. Like, what are you talking about? This is just, this, this is a poor immigrant kid. This is a, a poor kid, a Jewish kid. This is, this is a poor black kid. This is a poor Jamaican kid. This is a poor, like, what are you talking about? When you have that uniform on, you are looked at as, as, as an animal. You know, you are looked at. You're like you're 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 not looked at as low class. You look at like you you don't even matter. Your life doesn't matter. Um, so I, I think you know. I just think it, it's it's crazy, and 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 it all again stems from the politics. All of this crime, the lack of respect for police officers, the emboldening of criminals, all stems from the political crisis that has been implemented in new york city because all of us were too busy working and a lot of us believe the thing don't talk politics with your friends and i'm telling there to tell you this is why we're here you have to get out and vote you have to get out and vote in every election you have to know every one of your representatives your local sal greco said it and i agree with him a thousand percent your local politician will affect your life way more than the president of the United States will, way more. Get out there, know who they are. If you're in New York City, you have to watch these people. Um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna play a clip now of uh, from Lincoln Wrestler. He's quoting, uh, um, he's, he's talking about response times in the NYPD. Response times were up two minutes. So response times traditionally were at five minutes. There's been a two minute increase. Response time is now at seven minutes. I remember a time when response time were about three minutes uh, in New York City. So now they're to five. And actually in the last quarter of this year, they raised two minutes. So I think it's concerning. I do. I, I think it's concerning. And, and, you know, that's one of the things I said that I don't like the encryption for because they will try to hide how long people are waiting for 911 calls, what the responses are like. Um, and it could be you that it could be a response as a police officer too. You could call for an 85 or you could call for help and nobody comes. And you believe me, you're going to want the public to know that because that has happened in the New York City Police Department, even when our response times were up there, you know, within other units, on TAC channels, things of that nature. So Lincoln Wrestler, this is a quote from Lincoln Russell. Pat Lynch endorsing our white supremacist president. This is when Donald Trump was the president. On behalf of the PBA, the union rank and file NYPD officers is everything you need to know about policing in New York City. Time to defund. This is Lincoln Russell. So this is politics in New York City. The the dais is uh, the upper echelon of the New York City Police Department. And let's bring that up on the screen right now. And you're going to hear Lincoln Wrestler and then Eric. Let's get your thoughts.
The amount of firearms we're taking off the street to protect our community at all-time highs. Our enforcement in seven major crimes, those crew responses, all-time highs. So I don't want to lose sight of that. Okay, so I, I am not. There are very good. There are some important positive stories that are happening with public safety in New York City that I think are uh, that I am not disputing. What I am concerned about is our ability to respond to serious crimes in real time. There's a major increase, Commissioner, that has happened under your watch, especially under Mayor Adams' watch. It needs to be addressed. So what I want to hear from the department is what you're going to do about it. So, I get that there's protests happening in New York City. There are always protests happening in New York City. Not what I want to know is rate. what you're doing to speed up response times to serious crimes in progress. Like we talked about, there's tens of thousands of calls to NYPD every single day. And they gave a number since October 7th, NYPD has responded to over 1,800 protests a day in our city. Now take the totality of what you're talking about. Those numbers could be skewed, because if you're responding in Manhattan South, it could take you hours to respond based on 10,000 protesters walking through our streets. Commissioner Kaban. It's less sure. in the Bronx. So let's look at the totality of that. Commissioner 1,800 protests in New York City since October 7th. So let's be fair about that. Commissioner, I appreciate that there are always protests in New York City. There are always Not a lot of calls. Magnitude. There are always a lot of 311 calls. There are always a lot of 911 calls. What, frankly, I find most disappointing about this exchange is not that you're denying the report that came out from the mayor's office with NYPD's data about the response times to serious crimes in progress, is that you all seem surprised by it, that you're not aware of it, just, that just you're not. That, that report is, is on a fiscal year basis. A lot For of the, the first data, four months of this fiscal year, this clarify, fiscal year. A lot of the data that's tracked by the department is on a calendar year basis, except okay. budget stuff. So I'm very familiar with fiscal year, but a lot of the crime stats are calendar but year. But this is your, this is the mayor, this is Mayor Adams' report on how he and his agencies are doing. This is a major indicator moving in a very wrong direction. And what I'm hearing from the senior leadership of the NYPD is they're not even aware of it. It's just, you're not attuned to it. You're not responding to Council. it. And I want to hear what the solutions are for how we're actually addressing so, it. Listen, this is how we're going to address it. Like I said, this is accurate, all right? This is accurate. Let me go back to the command. Let me take a little deeper dive, all right? Ret response times can be skewed. They can be skewed. So you can have 60 precincts that are doing well, 65 precincts, 75 precincts, two precincts, it's that response city. time excuse the numbers and then we so gotta ask me, what's that commanding so, officer like doing said, and how we're managing is, it i appreciate sir, you saying you're coming a, back this is a broad look i'll give you some real details command by command hey this is where we're having a problem with and wherever we're having the problems with we'll get the additional resources and we want to help right so we want to think together about how do we actually improve this this is a serious concern i'm raising it because i want to help identify a solution together with you and support whatever we can do absolutely and absolutely. we're going to move we appreciate we're going to move to the next I member appreciate you pointing this out we will address it I have a lot of thoughts on this. I just want to, I, first of all, I, there's a statement I want to reflect on what he just said. And then I want to explain what, what are my thoughts on this. And it's going to go back to the statement that he just said. So Link, Lincoln Wrestler, that soft little man from New York City Council, what he said is, and I find it ironic, is he said, we want to help. Listen to that. The New York City Council member said, well, we want to help. Now, I will say this, going back to what the New York City Police Department said in their response, I am happy and I am proud at this point because I have been extremely critical of the leadership of the NYPD and so has John. But I'm glad that they're actually pushing back on this, on this claim about response times. I do believe they've missed the mark a little bit, but I am glad that they're actually pushing back. And I think they missed the mark because this was an opportunity to say, you want to help? Well, you know who created legislation and created all these obstacles that have created slow response times? I would have admittedly said, yes, our response times have slowed down. They have significantly diminished. Why? Because you, little man, you and your New York City Council enacted legislation that has created these obstacles, these deterrents from New York City Police Department for being effective. Yes, there are protests every day and every uh, we've had them. But something John Sh Shell said that was right was not at this rate, not at this magnitude. The protest and the riots that are happening used to be policed in a different manner. But because of a protest settlement that was sponsored by, by the New York City Council, it changes the way the police department can act and respond at 
protests, which are really riots that's going on right now in the city, along with other enacted legislation, such such as the How Many Stops Act. That's another hurdle for the police department that slows them down in doing police work. While simultaneously we experienced a mass exodus due to a mandate, due to other variables that have destroyed the police department. So right now we have to move resources from precincts that are suffering from high amounts of crime. Move those move those resources, which are deployment of police officers, actual men, actual manpower, to monitor these riots that happen day in and day out. Right, we're, 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 we're moving resources from one location to another, so we're now displacing crime. So crime that was being deterred in a precinct is now happening because we're moving it to monitor these protests and these riots that are happening day in and day out because we can't shut down these protests because they're First Amendment activity that's protected by the same New York City Council that claims they want to help. But that's the same entity that's created the problem. And I've said this a long time ago. I believe that they are the one. It's just like the the scenario from the movie Gladiator where the emperor kisses Russell Crowe on the cheek and stabs him on the back and puts the armor on so people don't see his bleeding. And then they have the actual fight. Well, that's what's happening is Lincoln wrestlers kissing him, say, we want to help you, and then stab in the back, give him the protest settlement, and then put the armor on and give the appearance that the police department could actually do their job. But they are the ones that cause this problem. Yeah, so I'll say right now, that was the best I've ever heard Ed Caban by far. I was like, oh, wow, he's in the game here. So kudos to you. Um, John Shell's trying to push the statistics, as he always does. Oh, gun crimes up, arrests up. And I've said that before. I think that highlights a, a, a public safety failure in New York City. I don't fault him for that. It's a lot. It's politics is at play. It's not his fault. They're going out there and they're they're standing on on the on the seashore, uh, like literally trying to fight the incoming tide. So that's why the arrests are up. But the arrests aren't a good measure of public safety. The arrests are the exact opposite of that. They're a measure of how much public safety has diminished because you can you can arrest your way out of the situation. You could prosecute your way out of the situation, unlike all the DA said at the same meeting. And we'll get into that in another episode, I'm sure. But you could prosecute your way out of it, but you definitely can't arrest your way out of it, when, especially when they're letting them out the door. So John Shell's trying to sell them on that. Uh, Lincoln wrestler comes out with his golden girls haircut. I don't know wh what barber he goes to and like what style that is, but it's definitely reminds me of the golden girls. Like you remember, they all had that same hair. If I had that haircut, I would definitely shave my head. Lincoln 1000%. That choppy, that choppy frizzy hair. <laughs> Dude, that was the golden girls haircut. That's what they all had. They all had that same haircut. So, but like, so this guy's abusing them, but, they're trying to give like relevant facts. But again, this individual has such a disdain for the New York City Police Department that it's not even funny. It's 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 actually way more arrogant and worse than what I heard from CCRB. You know, a complete utter. Dis he doesn't even want to listen to it. He doesn't care. He's like, I want to know what your plan is. They And you know what? They didn't even know response times were up. I'm sure they're aware that there's a problem in response times. But for the quarter, they weren't aware. Like, but they'll work on it. They'll get you the data. I think they handled themselves well. But I think that showed what I talked about on last episode, that I'm afraid if Jeffrey Madry leaves. The rumor is. He's out. He's getting three quarters. He's leaving. But again, he has the ability to reach across the aisle and make these people understand and talk in a rational perspective and and lay and get some type of normalcy and decency and get some leeway with these people. I just pulled up a tweet, though, with Lincoln Wrestler, because this is the stuff that bothers me. And I didn't comment on it, but I will in the future. Um, he he basically shares the police commissioner's tweet about Jonathan Diller. And he says, the worst nightmare of every police officer and their loved one and loved ones. My heart goes out to the family and friends of officer Diller. Your service to our city will not be forgotten. May your memories always be a blessing. You know, it, honestly, it, it, it hurts me. It hurts me when you read that because you and I, we feel it. We actually, we actually feel the pain of this. 
We know what the New York City police officers are feeling right now. They actually have to, they, CCRB talks about trauma. These police officers, after experiencing a, a, a death of their own, have to go back to work. Some, you know, the cops that are out there on duty in the neighboring precincts, in the neighboring boroughs, part of New York City, had to continue working, had to continue to respond to domestic incidents, had to continue to respond to critical incidents while knowing that a police officer was dying in, in, in the hospital. And yet, and yet, Lincoln Wrestler, who has a complete disdain for the police, which included an, uh, rhetoric to defund the police, you know, has the audacity to actually make that statement because we know it's, it, it's not true. He doesn't feel for, for a police officer. It's it, it's disgusting. It's it's disgusting to even hear that because you know it, it's just it's not real. It's not true. Uh, it, it it really it, honestly, I'm quite perturbed by it. It it really it bothers me. It, it really does bother me that. A little man like that just uh, has such a disdain for the police, but yet could never walk in the shoes of a police officer, could never be the man that Jonathan Diller is, was. It's just, it's disgusting. It really is. It's despicable, honestly. It just really despises me. Yeah, and it's also disgusting the way that he talks to the upper echelon of New York City. I mean, I know we beat these guys up a lot. Like, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about, about them, about their leadership style, about what they do. But I would never talk to any of them like that. I mean, that is – I wouldn't talk to anybody like that, you know, I mean, unless we were in a physical fight or I was trying to somehow scare you to de-escalate a situation. I would never talk to somebody like that. I mean, you could get your point across in a rational way, and I, I don't think Lincoln Wrestler can. You know, it, it – you know, he's probably had receiving vicarious trauma as well from sitting out and watching the news every day. So, I mean, but like, I, I think it was completely wrong what what he showed to the upper echelon and just showed his disdain for the police, how he really does. And that's why I pulled up that original tweet. Time to defund, you know, um, because that's really what he thinks about. He doesn't want he doesn't want to help. He doesn't care about public safety. He doesn't know anything about public safety. His only thing was, aha, I gotcha. And uh, somebody put, I put that clip out and somebody put, this is Comstat karma. Uh, I personally don't believe in karma. Uh, you know, I believe in God. I believe that everything happens in, in that hand. But I understand what you mean by it. Because what, what Comstat karma means is those same guys that are sitting up on that day as the upper echelon when they're in Comstat picking apart someone for an aha, I gotcha moment. You missed this one DV job or your detective missed this one video canvas when you are responsible for so much. This was the, oh, look, I got your moment. And it was it was right back at them. So shout out to whoever said that. I, I think it was headlines and quotes on Instagram. I'm not sure, but I think it was him. And uh, he said, uh, it's com it's Comstat Karma. And, and you know, what? maybe maybe it was a little taste of their own medicine. I, I agree. You know, we talk about this. I'm not a very, very religious person, but I do believe in fate and karma. And I do believe in karma. I do believe things come full circle. And, you know, I've sat through these CompSat meetings as a special operations lieutenant, and I heard uh, just the beratement that goes on from that dais towards commanding officers and special operations lieutenants and detectives and this, the squad commanding officers of detectives. And I've seen, I've seen them terminate detectives from their cases or to just remove special operations lieutenants on the spot based on something that they didn't like at that moment. So, yeah, I, 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 you know, do I think that they deserve it, right? Two wrongs don't make a right. I don't like to speak to people in that way. I don't believe that you have to respect everyone, but I do believe that you should show them respect. And I think that that also just shows how weak this man is, Lincoln, Lincoln Wrestler. He hasn't been humbled in his life because anyone that's been humbled in their life will be kind to others and treat others with respect. I do believe, even though I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of most of the upper echelon of the New York City Police Department, especially right now, the way they're running the police department. And I don't respect all of them, and, but I don't have anything personal with them. And I would continue to be professional with them, and I would show them respect. So I have to agree with you. I would not speak in that tone. I don't speak in that tone to anyone. Uh, it's just, it's just again, it, it, this was just a, an opportunity for them to further berate the police department. I think it's, it's, it's like abuse children syndrome. I think that the, uh, a comps that they abuse a commanding officers and the commanding officers then bring it back and they abuse the cops at the priest. And it's just, it's a cycle that has to break. We have to treat each other with respect. And what I see here is, is completely disgusting. I don't like it. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, there he is with his Blanche haircut. You know, he's about five feet tall, 130 pounds, soaking wet. Uh, trust fund baby. You know, grew up in a bubble in New York City that men like that are sitting, the men and women that are sitting on this day at that day has provided for him, um, thinking that everything's fine. And he could focus on his bills to attack ice cream trucks like he's done this summer. And I'm sure it'll come back up this this year. That's these are how serious city council people are. He's attacking ice cream trucks. So good job, Lincoln Rustler. Um, I don't know, man. It's 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 really been like, you know, it, it's horrible. I, I like staying off social media. I hated even doing the podcast, but I know people are, are looking forward to it. Uh, just on a lighter note, kind of want to just switch topics completely. Just completely before we wrap this up. We're going on an hour and 20. What do you think about Jake Paul fighting Mike Tyson? Uh, that's so funny that you ask it. I don't like it. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. I'm a huge fan of Mike Tyson. Love Mike Tyson. He's uh, he's just the epitome of what it is to be an extreme athlete, especially in that facet in boxing. You know, uh, I don't want to see him. I don't want to see Mike Tyson compete at this point with Jake Paul. I mean, this it, it's it's lose lose for Jake Paul and it's lose lose for Mike Tyson also. If Mike Tyson wins, he's still Mike Tyson, right? I mean, let's you know. But the bottom line is he's still a 58-year-old man. He's 30 years beyond his prime. Um, and, and despite what people say, you know, Jake Paul is a legit athlete. Uh, I think that he's he's done a phenomenal job. He's extremely smart being an influencer. Uh, has he has he boxed in the ring with, with older guys and guys that are really MMA guys? And MMA is really punching. It's not boxing. It's completely different. It's a, it's a different animal. Boxing is a different sport. MMA is fighting. Boxing is not necessarily fighting. Yes, if you know you have to endure mental toughness and physical, but it's not the same thing as an actual fight. You're held to different uh, different standards and restrictions. It's a different animal. I, but I think that Jake Paul is a legit athlete. Uh, but what people also don't talk about also is he's a young man who's being pumped with all kinds of chemicals right now. He's he's a prime time shape. I don't think his ability matches Mike Tyson if they were in the same prime. But it's a lose lose for both of them. I think it's it's entertaining, of course, but I I, I don't like it. I, I I don't even want to see it. But again, I think that you know people are, are shitting on Jake Paul. I think he's a legit athlete. I, I like what he's done. I think uh, the kid knows how to make money. He's a great influencer. I think I, and I think he's a legit. Uh, I think he knows how to box. I think he's doing a great job. And even though he gets in the ring with some older guys who are not really boxers, but they experience, he still has the balls and the guts to do it. But this actual fight. I don't like it. It's, I mean, listen, it's entertaining, but they're not even calling it an exhibition. They're calling it an actual fight. I mean, Mike Tyson's 58 years old. I mean, God bless him for wanting to do it. But I mean, Jay Paul's a young strapping man. And this is, this is, uh, I, like I said, I just think it's a lose lose. I don't think anybody wins in this um, money wise. Yeah, I mean, does Mike Tyson really need the money? I mean, I know one time he, he, uh, he was bankrupt, but at this point he's doing well in his life. He's got his, uh, podcast and he's always on different interviews you know I, I love mike tyson he like i said he is you know he goes down as one of the greatest in history maybe not uh with stats but just just uh you know just watching mike tyson it's always been it, it's been magical so again i i and i i really don't like people shit on jake paul i think the kid's doing some phenomenal stuff yeah no i uh first i'm definitely gonna watch it one thousand percent like but I agree with you. I don't want to watch it, but I admire Jake Paul's business prowess. I'm hearing 30 million in one night they're going to make. Um, so those are Mike Tyson numbers early 89 when he was at the peak, man, when he was, you know, when he was Iron Mike, when he was like you, you were buying a pay-per-view for 50 bucks and it was lasting five seconds. You know, he was throwing a couple of punches. The guy was going down. I mean, that was that was big money then, but it's still big money today. 30 million one night is uh is is a lot of money dude so i agree with you 100 percent with jake paul he's a big kid he's not a small guy whatsoever he trains every day he practices every day he is a boxer in my opinion i wouldn't want to i wouldn't get in the ring with him i wouldn't i mean he's twice my size and then on top of that he trains every day he works out every day i mean and and there's a reason he's not fighting in the boxing world is like you said, more than likely he's probably taking some substances that would be banned if he was actually boxing. Um, 
Mike Tyson, I hate seeing him fight at 58 years old. I hate seeing him fight a young, strapping man who's training every day. Mike's coming in. Is Mike one of the all-time greats? Yes. Um, can his skill overcome the youth? I don't know, man. I don't know. And again, I think Jake Paul's a lot bigger than him, too. Mike Tyson was never a big guy, man. He never was. I mean, he's a monster. He's built like a like a like iron mine. He's built like a piece of meat, but he's about 5'11. He's about 5'11, like 220. He's not a huge guy. I mean, he's not like if he was standing next to me and you, it would just look like a little wider, but he'd be the same guy, you know, not 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 too big. And he's 58 years old. So, but I know myself, and at, I'm at 58 years old, and I could fight and I could make 30 million in one night. I'm gonna do it. So I understand. <laughs> You know, it, it's funny, right? Because you know, I've been big into jujitsu the past couple of years, but I had a lot of time boxing. I love, I used to love to box. Um, but age is an age is a huge factor. Like you know, you learn when you're doing jujitsu. There's a belt system, and they have this thing called the Boyd system. And they kind of, it, Henry Gracie came up with it. And they kind of say like, you know, if two blue belts are sparring together, and if if there's a, a an age difference of ten years, that it's almost as if you're if you're sparring with someone who's a higher belt. So if you're 40 years old and you're a blue belt and you're sparring with a guy who's 30 years old and he's a blue belt, that the 40-year-old is really sparring with a purple belt because of the age difference. And also 20-pound weight difference, they usually say. So I think I'm sure the same thing has to apply when it comes to boxing. The fact that he's 30 years older, even though I don't think Jake, Cal Jake Paul has the same caliber as Mike Tyson, that age fa factor starts to, uh, you know, kind of fill in those gaps and and equal the, the playing field but again he's still 58 years old i do think that if mike tyson could finish this in, in the first or second round he has a great chance but i think if this goes on further into the rounds age is going to creep up on him and again i think jake paul from the way i see him um you know i've I, from everything I've read, I think he's hopped on all kinds of substances. I do think that him and his brother are propped up on a bunch of chemicals, which is why I think they're not actually, like you said, fighting legit boxes. But I do think, I do give them credit. I think they are legit boxes. I think that they train very hard. I think they have some, they have world, world class athlete coaches teaching them. And I think that these guys are serious. I think they, they, they take it very seriously. And I might hats off them because these guys, honestly, you got to give them credit. They spend all this time doing promotions. They're always on podcasts. They're big time influencers. And at the same time, they're training. So they're doing both. So whatever people think about the J Jake Paul or the, the Paul brothers, I mean, the guys are legitimately dedicated. They work hard. I'm sure this guy is, 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 is probably doesn't sleep much. He's working out all day. He's always diff different functions. So my hat is off to them for that. I have to say that. I think they are – Legit, I think those guys are – they work hard. I think they're dedicated men. Yeah, I mean, their business prowess is unbelievable. I mean, you know, if you could – I mean, just think about that. Like, I don't want to see it, but I'm still going to watch it. And I think everybody listening to this is going to want to watch it. You know what I mean? Every Oh, Tyson's fighting? I mean, just the fact – I don't even care who it is at that point. Like, all right, I watched the, the Tyson Roy George Jr. fight. I was like, this is ridiculous. I don't know why I'm watching it, but I had to watch it. You know, and it's the same for this. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want him to get in the ring. I don't, but I, but I understand it. So, by the way, did you? You have to. If you didn't see it yet, if anybody listening, if you're watching this podcast, you have to see the post interview of Tyson and and and, uh, and, and Roy Jones Jr. after the exhibition that they had. The interview was the most hysterical thing I've ever seen Mike Tyson do. You have to watch it. It was I hysterical. I it. I oh my god! You see the the guys interviewing them, and uh, Tyson is like, he's like uh, Roy Jones. You can see is like thinking, like I'm glad I survived this, and I don't want to ever do this again. Because he's like, hey, Roy Jones, you think you want to do this again? He's like, I don't know. I got to talk to my wife, and let me think about this. Mike's like, yeah, hey, let's let's run it back. It was hysterical. You got to see it. If you get a chance, go, go find it. Anybody who's watched this, I'm telling you, I, I love him, man. I think he's hysterical, dude. And he's you know what's funny about him. If you listen to him talk, he's actually pretty smart. He has a great life experience. He's he, he, he's and he's he's actually a pretty nice guy. But you hear some uh, some freaky things have happened. He's been in situations where he's disarmed people with firearms and didn't use any force. And talk about de escalation where he's taught people down. He's actually a pretty good human being. 
Yeah, no, I like Mike Tyson. I do. I know, like, when he was younger, he was a nut. He's still crazy. I'm not saying he's not crazy, but, like, <laughs> he's definitely mellowed out, and he's definitely wise, you know. He's definitely, like, there's a lot. He, he's, he's, I've listened to a lot of his shows, and, and you know, he's definitely wise. He says, a, he says a lot of, he says a lot of, a lot of things that make a lot of sense because he's got a lot of experience. You know, he grew up poor. He had nothing. He had a lot of anger in him. He got rid of that anger. Um, you know, he lost it all. He fell. He was the top of the world. He was top, top, top of the world. He went down to almost being a bum. I mean, I walked past him one day on 42nd Street. He came out when he, when he just got that tattoo on his face. He had a cut-off hooded sweatshirt. He was walking down the block. And he walked past me, and he was, you know, he was wide, dude. And uh, I'm like, who the fuck is that? And he stared at me, and I looked, and I'm like, who, who is that? And I just kept walking. And then I'm like, oh, shit, that was Mike Tyson. No bodyguards, no nothing. Just walking down the block with a, with a cut-off hoodie. I'm like, what the hell is that? I was like, <laughs> And he's like, you know, he's a street guy. So he's like looking at everybody, you know, like I, I was like, oh. It's like, that was Mike Tyson, you know. Um, but yeah, yeah, and he, you know, he went, he fell to like, to like almost like into poverty and then he he reinvented himself and he's and you know he's back up on top so you know i'm happy for him for that i just you know i just you know i don't want to see anybody get hurt i'd like to see jake paul get knocked out um but <laughs> you know i i don't think it'll happen though i don't yeah i i don't say if, if i had to predict right now i think this goes into the later rounds i think that unfortunately i think that jake paul's gonna win but uh again you know I don't want to see it. I mean, I'm going to see it, of course. I love Mike Tyson. But I, I just don't like it because I don't think that, you know, I think I hope it doesn't distort history, you know, and, and ruin people's uh, vision of what of who Mike Tyson was as, you know, as a prime athlete. That's the only reason. But I just think it's for both, it's a lose-lose. I mean, I think for the for the Jay Paul brothers, they're extremely intelligent. And they really do know how to make money. So, um, you know, I – if they if they ever have an opportunity, you know, if we could get them on this podcast, I'd love to have them on and, and pick their brains because these guys they're very business savvy. So, you know, and, and again, I, I said I think they're legit athletes. I, I really do. Yeah. So I just wanted to lighten it up a little bit. I'm like, I don't know. It's like, <laughs> no, I think I mean, it's great. I'm glad you brought that up. Actually, yeah, I yeah, think it's cool. Yeah. I need to just throw that curveball, but like, I'm just, I don't know. There's just a lot of stuff going on, and and it, it's it's always horrible. Whenever I I always feel like a certain way for a while. With anything, with any bad news, and you know we've all gotten bad news lately, and it's just, it's just, it really, it really starts to weigh on you. You know, it really does. Um, anything you want to talk about before we get off? No, I just want to say that uh, if, if I, I'm pretty confident that there are CCRB members, board members. I wouldn't be surprised if Jonathan Darsh watches this himself. And I will say that again, as overzealous as the CCRB is, and I think it's unfair and biased and disdain. I think there is a necessity for it, but I think it needs to be a fair level playing field. So I will say this in good conscience, Arvor Rice and Jonathan Darsh actually consider the totality of circumstances and actually consider what it is to be in the life of a police officer. So if your personnel is actually, actually experiencing trauma, which we're not denying that they probably are just consider the trauma that the police officer is experiencing on a daily basis and actually be fair and make the proper assessment and weigh in both and put your shoes at the in the put yourself in the shoes of a new york city police officer and actually experiencing this trauma uh, and again be a good human being have a good conscience and just be fair absolutely and anybody from the ccrb listening to this if you have any questions or you want to speak to myself or eric and you know you're weighing something out in your head or you don't understand something feel free reach out you know, we won't tell anybody. Reach out. We could have an offline conversation. Um, John, if you're listening, you want us to come speak to you, to you guys, we'll do that, too. You want us to answer questions, that's fine, too. I mean, I think, you know, you know, like Eric always says, opposition meets opportunity. Um, I think, you know, I think overall, even though a lot of us are on different paths, I do think the majority of people, even the people I don't agree with politically, do want New York City to succeed. I think they do want New York City to be a safe place. I just think that a lot of this, we're just we're just off base on a lot of issues. And I think that stems from not having the conversation. And I think a lot of it, again, falls back onto politics. And there's not a level playing field because you're not getting two sides because New York City has shifted so far to the left. 
And it would be the same scenario if it shifted to the right and only the Republicans were in control and they didn't have to listen to the left at all. You know, so th there needs to be a balance of power. There needs to be a balance in structure. This is how our country works. And for almost a decade, New York City has been on the predominantly progressive leftist control in politics. And that has affected the New York City Police Department, the legislation and the policy. So I think ultimately the goal really, and not only in the country as overall, but in every city throughout the country is to have a balance of power, right? The left and the right, you know, like I said, I have a, I have a, I have a daughter with special needs and like, there's a lot of things that the right would probably say, oh, we don't need to do this. And then there were ideas that helped my daughter that came from a leftist mindset. And so, you know, and, and there were things that were in place in New York City that were great that like now I'm in a red state that they're not there for, you know. And uh, so I think that always needs to be that balance. I just I think that's what makes a fair society that's what makes a society that we want to live in a society we want to raise our families in open business in be frugal and have common sense you know but uh i think what i spoke about it with tramel thompson where he he was asking about criminal justice reform and police reform and i was like i don't think it reformed anything i think they you know they they they, they didn't even overcorrect. they created more problems than they ever solved you know and i think we need to st start to to really look at that there's one more thing I wanted to add. This is really off topic and it's nothing to do with police work. I just want to honor and commemorate the lives of the unfortunate, unlucky passengers that were on the on the bridge in Baltimore uh, due to a, a, a collapse of that bridge. I think it's a, it's a complete horrific and crazy tragedy. It's just it, it's it's a crazy situation that uh, a ship actually took that bridge down. There was no d damage to the ship, just damage to the bridge, and it collapsed. And I think that there's six people. I've, I last I heard that six people that are still missing from that uh, bridge collapse in Baltimore. I think it's just, uh, I mean, it's just complete tragedy. It's something that nobody, no one expects. It's uh, that's a horrific incident, and uh, my heart goes out to the people that were on that bridge. It must have been the scare, uh, the scariest thing. And uh, it, it's just, it's just so crazy that something like that can happen. Uh, you know, you see like the Verrazano Bridge is just a structure of it. The the cement piles that are underneath that, that are put in place. Uh, you know, hopefully we've seen other bridges, bridge collapses. I think there was a big one. I think it was in somewhere in the Midwest about 10 years ago. This is something that really has to be examined throughout the entire country. This is sad. I hope that they find uh, all the people that were on the uh, on that bridge. Just uh, completely horrific. It's so sad. It's so sad that we're having all these, uh, these tragedies going on. Also, the incident that happened in Moscow. Uh, th that's another horrific incident just you know the world's a crazy place so enjoy every moment enjoy every day show everyone respect i say it all the time i really mean it opposition meets opportunity just because someone has different views than you don't try to win a conversation have a conversation to understand someone else's perspective respect theirs respect your own and just find a way to understand why they have their opinion and why you have yours and just respect it you don't have to win a, an argument you don't have to control an argument. You just have to respect them and they respect you. You know, there was a time, I will say this. There was a time, I remember, and this is the New York that we grew up in, John, that it didn't matter if you were left. It didn't matter if you were right. It didn't matter if you were a cop. It didn't matter who you were. Like, New York City was always a crazy place. It was a wild place. But everyone agreed on one thing. Everyone was in the pursuit of, like, being against crime. So that's just something we have to get back to. Like, you know. It's always been a wild place, but everyone was always against crime. The cops were on board. The people were on board. Like, you know what? And it was, so we need to go back to that. And, and and that was the New York City that we know. Nah, absolutely. Just before we go, though, because you brought up the bridge, I saw like a slowed down version of that video. What, what, what do you think about that? Like, what do you what are your thoughts on that bridge? Do you think it's, it was intentional or do you think it was an accident? It's interesting that you say that. Uh, I do believe. And I hope I'm wrong. I do believe that it was intentional. I, I, I just don't, you know, I, you know, I, I would, my brother and I were talking about this for hours. Like it's just insane how this happened and, and with that ship. I just, I, I think it's intentional. I really do. Um, and also it doesn't have those barriers to protect just like the Verrazano bridge. So I think that's known also that, that, that this had the ability for that to happen. H how about yourself? 
I, I wasn't sure at first. I, I thought it was weird, but I saw a video that's been floating around online where it shows like the time lapse. They sl actually slow it down and you see the ship make a sharp turn into the pylon. So I do, I think just based upon that alone, I do think it's intentional and I don't know the, the reasoning for it. But uh, Same here. I mean, but either way, intentional, not intentional, that is a very, very scary 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 thing uh i was like you know i was like i was actually like i, I couldn't i i really thought it was fake when i first seen it i was like this can't be real this can't this didn't happen you know? my hats off also i think it was the uh i think it was the fire chief he did a phenomenal job of 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 really t uh putting out a presentation and, and a speech about what happened uh i think the uh bolt uh both one mayor really missed the mark on it and I, I i watched i think it was the fire chief picked up the pieces and did a great job uh just uh, really, honestly, just completely horrendous. One more thing. Did you see anything about Puff Daddy today? No, no, no. I did it. <laughs> so supposedly the the feds raided his L.A. mansion and his Miami mansion. Something to do with like trafficking. Um, I don't know anything about it. Um, but I just I I I don't know. I was just curious if you did. I, I don't really follow like celebrity news. No. Like I said, I was caught up, you know, really discuss, discussing this uh, this bridge collapse all day. You know, I'm really, yeah. into, you know, I like wor I like working with my hands and structures and, you know, trying to figure out, like, how this can happen. That's why I, I really believe that it was something intentional. It just, it doesn't seem to make sense that, you know, that there wasn't reinforcements in place to prevent something like this from happening. I, I don't know. I hope we're wrong, but, you know, it's a crazy time going on. You know what? With that being said, I think we nailed it here. You have you have anything to add? No, I just want to tell everyone we're going to get ready to do a live soon. Uh, the live is going to be, should I leave the NYPD? We've been getting a lot, a lot of questions from a lot of different people uh, asking if they should leave for other law enforcement throughout the country. I really think it's a personal decision, but I think we should do a live on it so that there is a lot of different opinions on it so that whoever is contemplating leaving um, you could see a wide variety of opinions, right? And ultimately, it's a unique situation for everybody. So it depends on your own unique scenario. So, you know, I think that that's probably the first live we do. We'll, we'll put a flyer out ahead of time. We'll put it on our social media. Uh, we'll let you guys know when that is. And, you know, we, well, you know, we hope uh, you guys join us, get in the chat and, uh, you know, we won't expose anyone. Just get in the chat. We'll read out what you write. If you want us to, to, to say who your name is, we can. But uh, I, th I think it'll be good. I think it'll just be a good discussion for just 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 to shoot around the idea. You know, um, I personally still think the NYPD has the best salary and benefits throughout the country. Um, so I think that's something to weigh in. But I just I just want to give you guys the heads up on that. And, you know. Uh, and just really my thoughts and prayers are going to go out to all of you in this coming week. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to make it. Um, and I'm sorry I couldn't be there, you know, and I, I like Eric said, you know, I, I really do. These are the times when I'm, I do miss being a cop and I wish I was there. Well, so there's one thing I want to add. So it's come to my attention uh, through anonymous, an anonymous source of, you know, that we talk a lot about on this podcast about anti-crime work. We talk about what it is to do intrusive police work. We talk about the backdrop, the backdrop of CCRB being under attack when you're doing that type of police work. Uh, it's come to my, my attention. We're getting so much support from the rank and file of the police department that we don't. We we talk about this type of police officer uh, most of the time, but we don't usually talk about what it's like to be a police officer on patrol and the effects of CCRB on those police officers and uh, what they're bearing right now the actual patrol police officers and uh, going out doing overtime, working on the trains and then getting up after a few hours and going back on patrol and now bogged down with 25 to 30 radio runs, 30 radio runs a day because of a mass excess and, and extreme shortage they're facing. So I just want to say that uh, for the cops that are watching this, if you're on patrol, uh, we have nothing but the utmost respect and, you know, uh, just, uh, appreciation for what you guys do right now of course john and i spent most of our careers doing special operations and anti-crime work so that's our forte and we have a tendency to speak about that type of police work but we have the most extreme amount of respect especially for patrol the old saying patrol is the backbone of policing it sure is and that's the most important function of the police department before 
detective investigations could be done in those positions filled in special operations unit. We have we need good police officers on patrol. So we understand what you're going through right now. If you guys have any comments, have any questions, reach out to us at www.thefinestunfiltered.com. If there's anything you want to mention on the podcast, we can discuss it and explore different things. But again, my hat's off to you guys that are doing patrol or any facet right now, wearing a uniform out there. We know you're tired of the work, and uh, we thank you for everything that you do. With that being said, New York's Finest Retired and Filter Podcast, 265 Police Live Series. Let's turn it over to our friends at Lay Law Blue. Thank you. Law enforcement professionals dedicate their lives to serving and protecting our community. But who's protecting their financial futures? That's where Laidlaw Blue comes in. Our wealth management platform is specifically designed for the law enforcement community. Laidlaw Blue is a division within Laidlaw Wealth Management run by retired New York City detective John McDermott. His status as a retired detective uniquely positions him to establish a deep connection between Laidlaw Blue and the law enforcement community. Our platform is easy to use and provides a range of financial services, including investment management, retirement planning, and insurance solutions. With Laidlaw Blue, you can secure your financial future and provide for your loved ones. Our team of experienced financial advisors understands the unique challenges and opportunities that law enforcement professionals face. We're here to help you navigate the complexities of financial planning and achieve your goals. Laidlaw Blue, secure your financial future today. Book a meeting using the QR code displayed or call us directly on 888-901-BLUE. That's 888-901-BLUE.